everyone, and welcome to this edition of Community Producers. I'm your host, Cami Tanner, a local business owner here in Lethbridge. So Community Producers is a show that is produced and put on by volunteers, just like me, that features stories and segments all over Southern Alberta. Our first segment, we are going to go over to the local animal shelter and see some of the animals that are put up for adoption. I'm Officer Skylar Plourd with Lethbridge Animal Services and you're watching Pet Talk on Community Producers. On this edition, we're going to be talking about emergency preparedness and your pets. We'll also visit two adoptable cats at the animal shelter. This is Pip. He was found as a stray back in March and turned into the animal shelter. He has since been neutered, vaccinated, and microchipped. He's approximately three years old and he really is his own boss, as this guy loves to be the king of his own castle. This is Teddy. He was turned into the animal shelter back in January. He's approximately two years old. He's a shy little guy, but he warms up after he gets to know you. Teddy is microchipped, vaccinated, and neutered. If you're interested in any of the animals available for adoption that we view today or anything else at the shelter, you can check out their profiles on Facebook at Lethbridge Animal Services, and you can give us a call anytime at 403-320-4099. And of course, please share their stories and photos on your social media accounts using the hashtag opttoadoptyql. We wanna take this opportunity to help you include your pets in your emergency plan. First of all, we do suggest that you create an emergency pet kit for the pets in your household. These pets should include things like a 72 hour supply of food and water, food and water dishes, blankets and towels, extra leash harness and collar, litter, litter pans and plastic bags, small toys, medical records, proof of vaccinations, copies of ID tags and microchips for proof of ownership, current photo of your pet and any medication your animal might need. We also highly encourage you to have your animal registered with the City of Lethbridge. In the case of an emergency, first responders can use the licensing information to find out where pets are and what needs to be rescued. For more tips and information on emergency management and preparedness for your pets, check out lethbridge.ca slash animal shelter. Hi, I'm Darcy Logan. I'm the Curator and Gallery Services Manager here at CASA um, and I'm excited to be presenting several new exhibitions that are going to be running through the month of May. In the main gallery we have the exhibition Pluck by Edmonton-based artist Jamie Lee Girodat and her exhibition deals with uh, ideas around women's autonomy and uh, reproductive technologies that are developing. Uh, she originally got her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree here at the University of Lethbridge, so we're excited to be bringing her back into the community. As well in the main gallery, we have the exhibition Contours of Time by Troy Nickel. And Troy Nickel is a longtime contributor to the Lethbridge arts community, and he has a really unique and interesting exhibition that combines printmaking and sculpture and the rings of trees. A lot of my work is, is inspired by nature or influenced by nature, so um, you know, when you look at the uh, the print of a, of of, a tr of of the tree rings, you know the woodcut. Um, it just um, it, it just a, it, there's just a sense of natural beauty to it, a sense of simple um, symmetry, and um, each tree is different and unique in its own way. But yet, all trees have this sense of commonality. Like all trees are very similar to each other. Um, so I'm interested in just um, um, how nature kind of um, kind of exploring nature and, and, and just letting nature express itself in, its, in, in, a, in a really simple way. Upstairs we're pleased to present a really fascinating and uh, well executed exhibition called uh, Shadows from the Fire by Lethbridge artist Diana Zazadny. And again, Diana is an artist with an active studio practice here in Lethbridge, and she is showing paintings as well as cyanotypes and some elaborate wire sculptures. This exhibition is called Shadows from the Fire, and it was inspired by, or rather, it was 
developed by some ideas around the Keno fire that happened in Waterton Lakes National Park. And that's a place that I've visited all my life with my family and friends, gone hiking and sketching, drawing, painting. When the fire happened, it was kind of devastating, really, um, because it's such a beloved place for my family and myself when we go visit. And then coming back the next year and seeing everything come to life, it was um, pretty exciting to, even though the, the park's not the same anymore you, because of the burn, it, it was fantastic to see so many plants come back and the animals are still there. In the Passage Gallery, we're, we're pleased to be presenting the exhibition High Notes in Low Lighting by Richard Amory. And for those that might know Richard Amory, he runs LA Beat Online Arts and Culture magazine. And his exhibition brings a selection of photographs that document Lethbridge musical acts that have passed through town over the past about 10 years or so. Uh, the gallery at CASA is free to visit. Uh, we're open 9 to 9 during the week and 10 to 5 on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, for more information about our programmings, our educational offerings, please visit our website or visit us on Facebook. Thank you. For this next segment, I have to lead in with a joke. Why is a droid mechanic never lonely? Because he's always making new friends. So we're going to head over to Winston Churchill High School and check out their award-winning robotics program and maybe see some of the new friends they've made. Morrison from Winston Churchill High School. I run our robotics club here. Uh, we just got back from the Rocky Mountain Regional Competition in Calgary, uh, where we won with two other teams, one team from Idaho and one team from Hawaii. Uh, the competition went really well. The early rounds, we didn't score lots of rank points, uh, but we did score lots of individual points. Uh, we're able to get drafted by a really good team, uh, which has allowed us to qualify um, for um, the World Championship in Houston. Um, it's a club that's, this is year two. Um, last year we won a bunch of our rookie awards and this year um, we actually end up winning the whole competition and then now we get to go to Houston. I have a really good team of mentors um, from both Churchill and Chinook uh, that help us run our program uh, as well as community members and lots of really good sponsors. Uh, lots of smart kids in my program, uh, just preparing them for engineering jobs in the future and software engineering mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So we have myself and Kareen from Winston Churchill uh, are the staff members that are going to the competition. Uh, we have Michael Todd um, from Pratt & Whitney who's one of our mentors um, that's going to the competition and then we also have Steph um, from Chinook High School who is also going to the competition with us and has been super helpful with the paperwork and all that kind of stuff kind of moving up to us. The final match um, is actually held at Minute Maid Stadium so it's going to be there, it's going to be a big show. Uh, there's going to be six fields happening and uh, yeah, it's a really exciting event for our kids. Once in a lifetime experience for them. Being able to see um, the top robots in the world um, compete and competing against them and hopefully our robot performs really well, um, but also um, just to see the kind of science and technology and innovation that's happening uh, across the globe. Okay. Hi, my name is Amber and I'm from Winston Churchill High School. I'm Nolan and I'm also from Winston Churchill. I'm Hannah and I'm also from Winston Churchill High School. It started out a bit rough. We had some technical issues, but we worked through pretty fast. Yeah, we we ended up fixing what was what was wrong like right away and then once the actual competition started after the practice day we started out playing playing really well and doing everything we were supposed to competition we're supposed to start on this platform and each rope uh, then we're supposed to put uh, these hatches they're like big frisbees basically and you're supposed to put them on openings on uh, two rockets that were built and a cargo ship and then you're supposed to put uh, cargo which is like big uh, rubber dodgeballs and you're supposed to put them into another opening and the hatch balance is supposed to keep the dodgeballs in, in place and then for like each one each hatch panel you get on to the rocket or the cargo ship successfully is worth two points and each um, 
piece of cargo you get in was like three. And so, is and you try to get as many as you could as possible. And then in like the last 30 seconds, a timer went off and you're supposed to go back to this, uh, to where we started on this ramp. And there was like a three foot platform with a ramp, a six foot platform that was just straight up, or not six foot, six inch platform that was just straight up, and a, and a 12 inch platform that was just straight up. And like you could eat, depending on which one you could climb up to, you got a different amount of points. So yeah, and that's just an extra way to get extra points. So there are three, two, three team alliances that fight against each other during the competition. And at the end, we do a cascading um, draft yeah, to pick teams. And then those alliances play for the finals. Actually, I don't think, like, at the very beginning, we weren't, like, sure we would actually even make it to playoffs. Because, like, oh, yeah, we were like, okay, yeah, let's just go. And then it, like, came to, like, the final, like, the picking out the playoffs. And we were like, either we get picked or we don't get picked. And we got drafted by the two best teams. And so I guess that was, like, what shocked all of us the most at, um, before the playoffs started. I think, like, just meeting new teams, understanding, like, each one how they operate and so trying to figure out which ones are the best teams so if we do get into the playoffs there then we could maybe get drafted by them. Just the experience and just being able to actually go to Houston, meet all these teams, be at a big world scale competition as well as the finals played in Mid, Mid Park and I'm a baseball fan so that's where the Astros play. <laughs> I'm looking forward to learning new skills that we can apply to our robot. And last year I went because of the Dean's Award and I learned so much from the other teams. There's no business like show business. And our Southern Alberta's very own New West Theatre is celebrating 30 years this year. We're gonna go over and get some sneak peeks at some of the upcoming shows that they have and let them continue to entertain us. Hi Lethbridge, this is Sharon Pete from New West Theatre and I'm joined today by Kelly Ray, General Manager. And we are thrilled to be announcing our 30th season, our 30th anniversary season here at New West Theatre. We are starting this summer with a show called Divine, the Divine Women of Song. And we're celebrating everyone from Ella Fitzgerald right through to Beyonce and all of the women that make popular music as popular as it is. And that will run this August from August 7th to 24th, 2019 here at the Yates Theatre. We're going to follow up Divine with a September show and the September show is going to be Buddy the Buddy Holly story. It's a great musical, it's won Tony Awards, it's one of the most cherished musicals of all time, and we're really thrilled to be bringing it to the Yates stage. And that runs in September, from September 4th to 21st, 2019, here at the Yates Theatre. Then we're moving into the Christmas season and we are going to celebrate our 30th anniversary with the anniversary special Celebrate. And um, we're going to have a whole pile of what is best about U.S. and that is comedy review, those funny sketches and those great songs that make the holiday season just brighter and more fun. And that is coming up this holiday season running from December 18th, 2019 to January 4th, 2020. So be sure to check the performance calendar on that because with the holidays, we'll be straying ever so slightly from a standard performance schedule. And complementing our adult Christmas show, we have a kids Christmas show. And that of course is going to be The Legend of the Lost Tooth. It's an original piece that is being developed by Nicola Elston. And we are really excited to premiere this original piece here at New West. And that show runs December 21st, 2019 through to January 4th, 2020. And that will be here in the Yates Center at the Sterndale Bennett Theatre. And moving into March, we have a special show, and it is an original Canadian musical. It is called Dear Johnny Dear, and it touches on the country roots that make Alberta and make Lethbridge so special a community. And that runs next March from March 4th to 14th, 2020. 
Along with all of the great shows that we have going on in the Yates or the Sterndale Bennett, we are also doing uh, work with the Galt Museum down at Fort Whoopup, and we are also going to be performing out at Empress, uh, a show called Roots. So check out our website, www.newwesttheatre.com. That will have all the information you need about our season. It'll have links to buy tickets. It'll have prices and anything you need. And if uh, you need to give us a call, please call us at 403-381-9378. Thanks, Lethbridge, and we'll see you at the theatre. Lethbridge is a beautiful city with a tight-knit community, and that's why I love it so much. But we need to make sure that we're taking care of it so we can continue to enjoy all that the city has to offer. So we're going to head over to the city of Lethbridge to hear about a new safety initiative that they're implementing called The Watch. Mike Williamson. I am the sergeant uh, in charge of community engagement and development. I have been with Lethbridge Police Service for almost 16 years. The Watch is a community initiative that is designed to uh, make the citizens of Lethbridge and the community of Lethbridge a safer place to work, live, and play. We're mirroring it after a program out of Winnipeg uh, where they've been very, very successful and they've been around since 1996. Um, have about 250 volunteers and their mandate was to clean up basically their downtown. There is a watch manager who will be responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the watch and with them there is, um, we'll call them patrollers, uh, with the patroller there is a, what we call team leads and they will be responsible for the on the street operations along with volunteers. What you can expect uh, from the watch is they're going to be the eyes and ears for fire, uh, police, EMS, social services, health services. They're going to be in a uniform presence and uh, yeah they're going to be visible and what, what we want is for people to know that the red shirts are there and if there is undesirable activity that's what we're trying to help and curb. We have the full support of the BRZ uh, we also have the full support of the Chamber of Commerce and they're more than willing to do anything that they possibly can to get this off the ground. And, and it's that support that's really driving this and, and it really helps. Frank was here, and yeah. the, your family thought it was a good idea to get a van. Yeah, we saw the need for it. The lumber wagon that was used wasn't very good riding in, and to use an ambulance to take somebody just for a doctor's appointment or a test seemed like a waste of an ambulance, because somebody else that needed an ambulance wouldn't have it. So that's uh, what started going, and when I asked Dave, to look into it, see if they can get one. Was, was that a long process? Oh yes, it took a long time, over a year. I rode in it once, took me to Lethbridge for a test, and it, I was awake then, on the way back, I slept pretty much all the time, so I don't know what it rides like coming this way. <laughs> the response back that we've had from our residents is that they love it. It's comfortable, uh, they, they really appreciate the fact that it's comfortable. When people are going for tests or appointments, they're already stressed to some degree. They may be very ill. Um, they may have a lot of worries about what they're going to be told or, 
or what's found out at their appointment. To actually have a vehicle where you're comfortable, it just makes that a whole lot better and they come back more rested, they don't come back as sore as they used to. It's just nice for them. How important is it to support the Hospital Foundation? Oh, on a scale of one to ten, I'd say it's an eight. Far better than waiting for some of the government officials to do stuff. Well, it'll if it gets equipment that stays here, it could be better for the person that has to come in the hospital or to emergency, and also possibly attract doctors that uh, are a little more specialized. I also think it's really quite valuable that um, that the donations that we receive can stay here in the community and be used to buy equipment that we may not have had the funds to, to purchase. Like there's a lot of things that we think would be really lovely to have that would Im improve patient comfort, improve the way that we provide care, and sometimes there just isn't money for those things. So I first became familiar with the continuing care sector when my grandmother transitioned from supportive living to long-term care, realized what an important time it is in someone's life and the capacity that the staff have for quality of life. I also realized the impact that my family's resources had. We were able to visit often and to support my grandmother in participating in um, programs and activities outside of the care facility that not every resident had. And being someone who's concerned about health policy and equity, realized that no matter how many family members they have available um, or the resources at their disposal, that they could participate in a full range of activities and really get a lot out of that time in continuing care. My research broadly looks at care for older adults. I look a lot at rural long-term care, so that's one of the studies that I'm involved with, and the other one looks at sexual expression in continuing care homes. Julia came out to a staff meeting uh, one day and she uh, introduced herself to my staff, introduced her project. The project that Dr. Brasilato proposed to us had to do with best practice in long-term care. And we are always looking to do what we can do to make our seniors' lives easier and better and give them more quality of life. So we were hoping through helping her with her research and looking at the recommendations that she would later make that we could use those best practices that she came up with and incorporate them into our practice. During the research, she had two researchers here uh, for 16 hours a day for seven days during one week. So they got a really good feel for what goes on in the facility. Uh, they also talked with residents in the community that came in to visit and, and tried to determine what the impact of having a long-term care had on the community as a whole. Their research, I felt, was very thorough and came up with some really good ideas. And I'm hoping to see that those recommendations go right to the policy-making people in Alberta. Because if we can get some resources behind what some of those recommendations are, we can improve quality of life for our seniors. And we can make these facilities more like homes than like a facility. Our community partners are incredible. Pretty much anyone who I've approached about research has been willing to be involved, has helped with recruitment, has helped with dissemination of our findings, and that's priceless because we have people who are excited about research um, and excited to share it. If we're looking at long-term care, a lot of people imagine it as care for particular generations or cohorts and not thinking of the fact that it's likely their parents or their parents' friends or their aunts and uncles um, and themselves and their friends and cohort will need those services too. So it's not for a distinct population that's out there. All of us, if we are lucky enough to get older, will have the opportunity to use those services.
does it for this episode of Community Producers. We hope you enjoyed all the stories and features put on by our volunteers from all over Southern Alberta. I'm your host, Cami Tanner, and we'll see you next time on Community Producers.